Portfolio queries the government's spending on infrastructure developments. Women's Forum reveals an increase in sexual violence against women and children. And hundreds pack the St. Charles Luanga Catholic Church to farewell late MP. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. Good evening, this is Wednesday's News. It's good to have your company. Opposition leader Don Pollier wants all major infrastructure in and around the country to be inspected. Pollier called on the Institute of Engineers and other relevant authorities to take a stand for the good of the people of Papua New Guinea. The opposition leader is questioning the quality of work by contractors and the amount of money funding projects in Port Moresby and other provinces. Opposition leader Don Polia says his observation of awarding of major contracts and development of infrastructures in the country, especially Port Moresby, is fishy. He says the government should have spent less money in building huge projects. Polia criticized the O'Neill Dion government and the awarding of contracts to certain businesses and its processes. There should be somebody who should go out there and check and justify or verify these contracts awarded uh, to public companies. In the meantime, the opposition leader called for a prudent approach by Institute of Engineers and other agencies to inspect and evaluate the work carried out for all government-funded projects. I'd like to uh, call on uh, various bodies to investigate into this uh, because it is very uh, uh, damaging to uh, other businesses, uh, to uh, micro, uh, small, medium enterprises. Polia says it's about time leaders must serve with honesty and not gain through resources ordinary Papua New Guineans should benefit from. If they continue to accumulate wealth to themselves, they will kill this country in no time. There will be no shared prosperity. There will be no inclusive growth. Uh, you will find the country will suffer and suffer the worst. He also called on the working team to establish the Independent Commission Against Corruption so it can play its role to strengthen transparency in the country. Jack Lapave, Jr., National MTV News. Constant rain in Port Moresby has caused havoc for relocated settlers and customary landowners at the Tagua community along the Magi Highway. Leaders say the rough work by developer Parga Hill Development Company has caused soil erosion and landslips, leaving gardens and homes damaged. The Tagua community want the developer to address the issue. This lesson in Ino happened before. The work done by developer Paga Hill Development Company to allocate land for Paga Hill settlers has left gardens and homes destroyed. Residents there, including relocated settlers, could not prevent the soil erosion and landslip last night and early this morning. This is company come. Um, grade him this lab, go, go, go. Now, bag rubbing this lab, long and rain come now. Okay, the stone was on him come now. Karma, Mary, I'm blown me plan, a place blown me plan, and now I'm directing what I come along, wrong side. Where road is tabling in. This land, me calls for the company, I pay him all got something now. Leader Sir Peter Ball says the developer must step in and play its responsibilities, which has caused valuable properties and life support projects ruined. Okay, the farm again, I tell you, we plan me, okay, they have them car and go, go down, okay, that now. Broke my house, big, blow me now. Big to them, close to them, die, when me and ground go past his stuff, and I'm here, I'll see him. Sir Peter, who has lived there for over 30 years, said nothing has happened in the past prior to the purchase of the piece of land to reset all the Paga Hill residents. But soil erosion is not the only problem. No proper water drainage and no supply of electricity are just some issues the settlers and customary landowners face. I walk in my house floor, Lord, set him some place floor, Lord, sit down. All must come walk in my house first time, all must walk in good road first time. All get a sunny name by your right. No God now, I packed him all in and I packed him in too, and big place too. Community leaders say that Tagua community will face a much bigger problem if nothing is done in the coming days. However, the Paga Hill Development Company says it will assess the damage before making any further considerations. Jack Lapave Jr., National MTV News. Four bridges in the Usunobundi district electorate rather, in Madang have collapsed following continuous rain since the weekend. This includes the Asas and Tessawai bridges. 
the collapse has cut off road links between Ramu and Medang town. As of this morning, the water level at South Sea has risen to over 2 metres, forcing over 30 vehicles to be stranded on the Medang side of the highway. Electricity was cut off since 11 last night and classes in the affected areas have also been suspended. The highway has remained closed for about three days now. The Buluma Bridge in the West New Britain province is a core bridge connecting Hoskins to Kimbe. Over the years, the bridge has deteriorated and most recently its collapse has disrupted the interprovincial transportation of goods and services as floods continue to sweep through villages in the province. West New Britain Governor Sassindra Muthuvel is calling on the national government for financial support to assist in the reconstruction of roads and infrastructural developments. The Buluma Bridge is situated along the Biala Highway and currently sits on a culvert. In 2006, the bridge had collapsed entirely and most recently has caused delays in the transportation of goods and services along the highway. Governor for the West New Britain province, Sisindra Muthavil, said the government had made commitments to assist with the reconstruction of several infrastructural developments but have fallen short to deliver. Let me appeal to the national government at least releasing this money blow, building Buluma Bridge, and Ali can build this bridge. Money Ali can release a maintenance blow, national road. Here on the national road where they are connecting money to Kimbe Town. With the weather the main cause of the flooding and closure of roads, Mutavil says economy activity could be affected. The road that runs through all four districts is the lifeline for the oil palm industry. Me feel sorry time me go to Biel, uh, Kimbe to Biala Road, just close to Lobuusi or before Lobuusi yet. Road am totally cut off and water was just flooding because there is no drainage and water coming all the way from mountain and it's crossing the main road, washing away the road and then it's going into other oil palm blocks. And people's blocks are now, you know, piled up with so much of mud and, you know, sand and all those things. And they are going to lose the income from that oil palm block. Villages living along the Biala Highway have been affected. Their gardens have been washed away and the chances of transporting food from Kimber Town have become difficult. In previous years, the provincial government has taken temporary measures to maintain the roads. Muthaville says this has and will be an ongoing issue and demands for drastic measures to take action. National road, na money all got something. National government put him underneath the Department of Works. Na minister after minister, na all got to give him kind also and promises na na behind this like something you know come up. This is really frustrating. Lorraine Genia, National MTV News. Among stories after the break, sexual violence against women and children highlighted at today's Women's Forum. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Deputy Opposition Leader Sam Basil has raised concerns about the future of the Ombudsman Commission because MPs investigated are still in office. Sam Basil says key ministers being investigated may opt to change policies that can render the Ombudsman Commission powerless. Basil says MPs who are being investigated remain in control of development funds and can influence the backbenches. He has made a call to the MPs in the backbenches to take a stand to save the Ombudsman. He urged Governor-General Sir Michael Ogio to dissolve Parliament because the number of government's MPs investigated have increased, indicating corruption. Investigations have been conducted on large sums of cash reported to be smuggled out by Chinese nationals conducting business in the autonomous region of Bougainville. It's also being reported that monies aren't being deposited with the bank operating in the area. Findings of this illegal activity will recommend appropriate laws and policies governing foreign investors. Chinese nationals operating business activities have been reported not investing money back in the autonomous region. In an exclusive interview with autonomous Bougainville government, Commerce and Tourism Minister Wilfred Komba, he said this illegal activity has been ongoing and the department is investigating the matter. Chinese operating trade stores and fast food shops in Boca under the Bougainville spouses and business partners. Instruct my CEO to and my staff in the Commerce Department to really 
investigate it and they can and then we can put a stop on, on it. Concerns were raised on large amounts of cash ferried out of Bougainville and not deposited with the commercial bank. It's understood the comprehensive Bougainville investment policy designed to protect local investors welcomes foreign investors but to engage only in big businesses and not small to medium enterprises. We were actually talking about big businesses, not this kind of trade stores and all this, you know. And most of these trade stores, they have been invited by the people of Bougainville themselves, you know, through their marriage uh, linkage and all this. And when we were talking about investment from the Chinese, we were not talking about these trade stores and all this. The findings will drive appropriate laws and policies that will encourage all foreign companies to invest their money and become genuine partners for Bougainville's prosperity. We, only, we, I mean, we have a policy. We, we only welcome those outsiders who are, who are, who are honest with, with which they have, uh, which they have the resources, you know, especially money and this and uh, who want to come and involve in bigger business where us born billions cannot do. ABG Agokohe constituency member Peter Soya also raised similar concerns to Newdon FM, stating it's now common knowledge among Bogan villains. Chinese operating stores in Buka aren't investing money in the region, but instead send cash and coins through normal commercial flights and coastal shipping services. Soya says such practice is unhealthy for Bougainville's economic recovery and for banks and other financial institutions resulting in withdrawals higher than deposits. The Bougainville Police Service are aware of this fraudulent activity happening and upon investigations found out these Chinese don't bank their money. Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. The Bougainville Police Service has raised a concern on firearms used for armed robberies in Buka Town. Three recent armed robberies were with the use of firearms that pose a danger to lives of Bougainvillians and others residing in the autonomous region. While investigations are continuing, a strong appeal has been made to those in possession of firearms to surrender to the Bougainville Police Service. Law and order with weapons disposal are pillars of the Bougainville Peace Agreement. Preparations are underway for the annual Waigani Seminar. It is, a joint, it is jointly supported by the University of Papua New Guinea, the NEC and the Prime Minister's Office. The organising committee hopes to raise 5 million kina to facilitate the seminar. The seminar is an avenue for think tanks to come together and discuss developmental issues and a way forward for the country. It's also an avenue where academics share ideas that may influence government policies for the betterment of the country. Since its inception in 1967, University of PNG has hosted the Waigani Seminar. It has been the engine room where all ideas and policies have been discussed and developed for the country. This year it will be staged from August 19 to 21. The Waigani Seminar Working Committee met yesterday to give an update on the preparations. About effective leadership and good governance, it's not only at the political level, no. It also encompasses the social the economical, the political, and also the spiritual dimensions of things. I mean, we had that in traditional Papua New Guinea. And now we are in contemporary PNG society. And so how do we look at that and our reflections on that? So as a committee, we believe that was the best thing for this 2015 Waigani Seminar. This conference is facilitating updating as well as reporting on progress that has been made so far. And it's a very important uh, uh, partnership uh, arrangement between the Prime Minister's Department, which houses the vision 2050, and the university is taking on from here in order to now facilitate uh, further discussions and dialogue on reporting what has been achieved so far. The Waigani Seminar has been an intellectual platform that has brought together think tanks and academics to review and criticize policies goals and objectives of the government that may have failed and for them to provide solutions the way forward, such as ways to achieve goals in the medium-term development strategy. Have that 
that interaction with everybody so that you, you're getting a forum which is going to reflect what the country really needs. And uh, it's also an opportunity for scholars to uh, better themselves and to take themselves to not only maybe uh, the national level, but also to a regional level and to an international level where they can kind of get into a debate which uh, e economics all around the world um, is impinging on PNG and we need to be able to react to that. And I think this is the forum that's there. Press, uh, the ideas about what they think about the government, what do they think about the economics, what do they think about the resources, what do they think about how, where do we want to see Papua New Guinea in the next 50 years, next 100 years, and where do we head from there? I think basically that's, that's the idea about why we have Waigani SMS every now and then coming forward. And so far, the committee has received favorable response from various sponsors, including a pledge of 500,000 kina from the Department of Prime Minister and NEC, the National Gaming Board with 150,000 kina, and a 50,000 kina commitment from the National Housing Corporation. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. Revenues collected by the government from extractive industries should be parked at the right place, says opposition leader Don Pollier. Mr. Polian said government's advance anticipation of the LNG revenues through the National Petroleum Company of PNG has now sound economic justification. He called for the establishment of the Sovereign Wealth Fund and criticizes the government with its slow process. If the government has decided that the NPCP is going to get all the proceeds that are coming in in terms of dividends on behalf of the city, we would like to know through the parliament process. We would like to know. So how much is supposed to come into the uh, sovereign wealth fund? If the sovereign wealth fund is not going to be used, then the prime minister must explain why. And now we check out the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3775 US dollars in the interbank market. And at Bank South Pacific, your Kina was fetching 0.37 US dollars, 0.4817 Australian dollars, 0.3423 Euro, and 44.48 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and cocoa closed the day lower, copper and gold closed the day higher, while copper, crude oil and palm oil all closed lower. And finally on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 194 points lower, the ASX closed at 31 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed at 31 points lower as well. Still to come on National MTV News tonight, the funeral service today to farewell Goilala MP, Daniel Mona. Stay with us for that and more. Good to have you back with National MTV News. Hundreds gathered this afternoon at the Charles Luanga Catholic Church to farewell the late Goilala MP, Daniel Mona. The MP in his eulogy was described as a man who had the heart for his Goilala people. He will be buried at the weekend. The body of the late Goilala MP was brought into the chambers of parliament this afternoon. The prime minister and some state ministers were there to receive his coffin. After the viewing of his body at the parliament, he was taken to St. Charles Luanga Catholic Church for his final blessing. <laughs> Hundreds gathered to witness the late MP's funeral. He was described by the Bishop of the Golala Catholic Diocese as a man who thought of his people. The MP had a colorful career as a public servant. He was a journalist by profession before moving into the political arena. He shared the same sentiments as his father before him, was the first MP for Golala and former Minister for Defense Louis Mona. The MP grew up in Tapini, a rural area in the country that has seen little government assistance for years. However, in his term as MP, he did his best to bring much-needed services to his people. Late last year, he fell ill and died early this year in a hospital in Manila. His body will be flown tomorrow to Tapini and on Saturday laid to rest in Mondo, his mother's village in Goilala, Central Province. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. Anger Provincial Police Commander George Kakas has called on all partners involved in the Pogara call-out operations to replace the current joint forces. He says although the joint forces have managed to reduce crime, mostly related to illegal mining, the use of force by police on the community outweighs the good. He has suggested that the joint forces comprising police and defence personnel be replaced with the community policing concept. 
PPC Kaka says in the last three years, there has been three call-outs costing the government over 30 million kina. While he appreciates the joint forces' work to maintain peace in Pogera, he was concerned at their approach to civilians. He has seen the good and the bad sides of the joint security forces. Uh, getting troops from outside, uh, uh, reactionary troops, uh, who are only there to install uh, retributive justice, uh, reaction uh, to problems. But what we want to do is uh, to see if we can solve problems at the village level when and when they happen. PPC Kaka says the community policing concept will make communities responsible in maintaining law and order. But he says the joint security forces in the call-out can be deployed if and when the situation gets out of control. Existing village courts, the LLGs, to see if we can take ownership of the problems ourselves uh, and solve those problems uh, from the, from the uh, grassroots level. Since the first call-out was made in April of last year, crime rates have dropped at Pogera Valley, mostly related to illegal mining activities. Barry Gold, the developer of Pogera Gold Mine, is a major corporate partner in the call-out operation due to increased illegal miners and the rise in criminal activities in the Pogera Valley. Some of the success of the Joint Security Forces contingent team, headed by Commander Norman Campbell, include the successful negotiations between relatives of a female deceased employee and workers of IPI Mountain Transport Limited. Relatives of the disease held two IPI fuel tankers on ransom and demanded 2.5 million kina compensation. However, through the Joint Forces intervention, they negotiated for the release of the two trucks and ordered all parties, including Barry Gold, to meet and solve this issue once and for all. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. Issues surrounding National Housing Corporation's tenancy form agreement has surfaced after Managing Director John Degge claimed his signature must be on it before a new tenant occupies a house. But that tenancy form requires only the new tenant and the NHC estate officer's signatures. Calls are being made by new tenants of a recently evicted flat at Tokarara NCD for Mr Degge to clarify if NHC is now using a new template. Mr Degge said yesterday in a media statement that he was the duly authorized signatory to the NHC tenancy form. However, a copy of the form shows that there was no space for the managing director to sign. It has space for only the new tenant and the NHC estate officer to put down their signatures. This has sparked confusion with a new tenant of a recently evicted unit at Tokarara. These are all contributed to one person's decision who is digging himself and now he's trying his best to hide. He's trying his best to justify what he did by saying he did not put his signature on the tenancy form. This is the tenancy form here. It doesn't state or it doesn't show in a bold writing where the case is going to put your signature. It only states housing commission officer who is the estate officer himself and the tenant who is to occupy the flats or the house or whatever. But put him signature on which it was fulfilled. Mibla put him signature on estate officer put him signature So why are we pushed now? Thomas Marinai and his wife Philomena were victims of an NHC reverse decision. Last month, Mr. Dege ordered the eviction of four tenants, but in less than a week, issued another instruction for them to reoccupy the flats. Mr. Dege claimed he was poorly advised and was not him signing the tenancy agreement, but an unauthorized officer. His claims were brushed aside by the couples. Ember put him signature blame. On this tenancy agreement form is written here, it says witnessed by NHC housing officer. It doesn't say that witnessed by the MD of National Housing Commission. So I want to make it clear to Dege, if you are watching now, you must have a awesome. on this tenancy agreement form, it's written here saying witnessed by National Housing Officer, not NHC Housing Officer, not the MD. Philomena says the MD must not give excuses, however, must meet with the new and old tenants of the Tokarara flats and sort out the issue. However, Mr. Dege claimed all confusion has been settled. Quinten Alomp, National MTV News. Perceptions of Papua New Guinea as a highly dangerous country have been proven wrong 
by tourists from the United States. These observations were made during their visit to Pororan Island in the autonomous region of Bougainville. The tourists said PNG has much more to offer in terms of economic resources with a high potential in the tourism industry. Papua New Guinea's tourism industry is of great potential and in high demand. Recently, the Ocean Discoverer anchored in Bougainville waters and tourists were treated the Melanesian way at Poran Island in North Bougainville. Delighted by the island's natural and scenic beauty, tourists say Bougainville is a tourism destination with high potential and is another target tourism spot for international tourists. Tourists were entertained. When every boat that comes, they will come back for sure. Because this was uh, something I have never seen before. Yes, it was extraordinary. With yeah. the intent of only getting to Papua New Guinea, that was my entire goal. And everything about this visit has been surprising and wonderful. Because the people are so warm and welcoming, and I was completely surprised that we had never, that no other cruise ships had come to this port. And how lovely for us, and how welcoming they have presented these programs and the dances and the tours. It's been marvelous, absolutely marvelous. The trip, organized by Stanford University in California, aimed to promote and market tourism in Bougainville and Papua New Guinea on the world map. In the meantime, while the potential is high, the Bougainville Tourism Office appealed to the autonomous Bougainville government to invest more and support to develop the tourism industry. <music> Fabian Hakelitz, National MTV News. The University of Papua New Guinea is breaking new grounds with the introduction of a new course. The Diploma in Comprehensive Hazards and Risk Management, or CHARM, will equip students with the appropriate knowledge to deal with climate change. The course has been developed over time in partnership with other stakeholders. After more than five years of developing the program, it has finally been implemented this year. The MOU signed today with the Ministry for Provincial Government testifies to a long-standing partnership between the two organizations. Under this partnership, the Ministry for Provincial Government will assist UPNG with 50,000 kina to implement the program, while the European Union 60,000 kina. Both the National Disaster Center and the Environmental Science and Geography Discipline within UPNG School of Natural and Physical Sciences have trialed the program with its third and final year students. After a review, it was accepted as the Diploma in Comprehensive Hazards and Risk Management. UPNG's Vice Chancellor, Professor Albert Mellam, commended both parties for developing a modern and comprehensive course. The School of Natural and Physical Sciences has recognized the importance and value of uh, creating a platform that allows the university to interact uh, with the community uh, in the provision of knowledge transfer uh, in the area of uh, hazard management uh, so that uh, our people can have this knowledge amongst themselves to uh, react when they confront uh, uh, challenges like the one we are witnessing at the present time in Moresby. The course allows students to be appropriately skilled to recognize the climate change issues. Melam says deans in respective schools will be put on notice to ensure students enrolled in this program get the most out of it. The uh, professor of environmental science, Professor Kalawin, on notice uh, that the academic auditor will be coming uh, to visit him at the end of this year to find out how he has inbuilt quality uh, and quality uh, parameters in the delivery of this program. Secretary for Provincial and Local Government Affairs, Munare Uwasi, is pleased with the outcome and wants a more practical approach in training of students. We want some practical training that's given to the staff of the National Disaster Office. And also train people in the area of disaster management, hazards, 
and risk management and all those things. I don't think you know we have this in this country. Correct. Not yet. Correct. One of the problems that we face in the department and also at the disaster center is the skilled people who can monitor and manage what is happening around the country in terms of weather changes, the risks that we face, and disasters that are facing the country. And the staff shortages have been a long uh, problems that we have, both in the department and the disaster center. And coming to university, we need your assistance. National Disaster Office has struggled to deal with disaster management with shortage in skilled staff. URC is confident the program will bridge this gap. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. Overseas now and an incredible story of survival in the United States. An 18-month-old baby is doing well in a hospital in Utah in the care of professionals and a loving family. Lily Grausbeck was found trapped, was trapped in the wreckage of her mom's car upside down for 14 hours in a freezing river. Rescuers who found Lily said a voice guided them to her. Lily's mother was found dead in the vehicle. Late Friday night, a man living in this neighborhood outside of Salt Lake City hears a crash. He looks outside his door and sees nothing. What he doesn't know, a car has skidded off the road and is now partially submerged in the Spanish Fork River. It takes until noontime Saturday for the car to be spotted. A local fisherman sees the overturned vehicle in the water. The witness said that there was a, an arm that he could see inside the vehicle. The fisherman calls 911. Spanish Fork police officers respond and wade out to the car. Felt like I could hear somebody telling me they needed help. Um, it was, I mean, it was very surreal, something that I felt like I could hear. They're not sure where the voice came from. When they get to the car, the scene is grim. 25-year-old Lynn Jennifer Grosbeck is dead in the driver's seat. But in the back seat, rescuers find her daughter Lily, just 18 months old. Lily is in her car seat, hanging upside down in a part of the car not submerged in the water. The toddler is unconscious and unresponsive, but alive. The officers flip the car over. Grabbed the baby in my arm, raised it up, raised its head up out of the water as I tried to release the seatbelt. The child was passed to me, and I just ran up and climbed in the ambulance with the child. For about 14 hours, Lily had survived hanging upside down in freezing temperatures in the upper 20s with no food or water. It's amazing. Children are very resilient, and um, I think sometimes we don't realize how much they actually can withstand. As for the temperature, being cold might actually have helped Lily. When you become hypothermic, it slows the body down. Metabolism drops, your oxygen consumption drops, your glucose metabolism in use drops. It actually ends up being neuroprotective. In the end, the main reason Lily survived this awful crash is that her mother buckled her up in a car seat so she didn't go through a window or drown, something that isn't surprising to Jennifer's sister. She loves Lily with all her heart. She was the love of her life. Primary Children's Medical Center says the toddler is in stable condition and improving. The family shared this about her today. Her improvement is astounding. Right now, she's watching Dora and singing Wheels on the Bus with Grandpa. She's smiling and laughing for family members. We're blown away by Lily's progress and so grateful to her rescuers. And National MTV News continues with True Guy Sports. That's coming up next after these short messages. Stay with us. Two Kai Sports. Welcome to True Kai Sports. The PNG Sevens team have gone into camp at the IPA Park in the lead up to the 2015 HSBC Hong Kong Sevens. The team struggled in their first leg of the World Rugby Sevens Series circuit but are hoping to bounce back. The team has received a timely boost with youngster Jordan Chichenko making his debut in the train on squad. The boys struggled to draw results from their last leg of the World Rugby 7 Series circuit and will have to implement changes to the side in order to see progression. Despite their improved performance at the Borneo 7s, the level of competition demanded in this leg is far greater. The team finished third winning the plates in the Borneo 7s. 
The Train On squad is now undergoing a training camp at the IPA Park for preparations leading into their second biggest gig for the year in Hong Kong. Last month, assistant coach Douglas Guy said he had every confidence in the team, but there were areas that needed improvement. The recent inclusion of Jordan Chichenko to the squad should see changes in the boys' gameplay on the wing. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. The uncertainty on the delivery of the games remains a growing concern. With the continuous downpour in the capital city, concerns have been raised as to whether construction of the venues will be delayed. Once again, MTV's Lorraine Genia has this report. Today, in a statement, Minister for Sports Justin Chichenko again confirmed the proceedings of the Games. Quote, this is a load of rubbish. We have more important and pressing matters to talk about at this stage of our preparations leading to the July Games. Chichenko has given assurance the government has maintained time and time again they will not fail. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill earlier in the year had also urged the country to use the Games as an opportunity for nation building. Nearing 100 days till the Games, the preparation of the majority of the major venues have reached the final stages of construction. Both major stakeholders, the Games Organizing Committee and government have maintained their level of confidence in delivering the 2015 Port Moresby Pacific Games. In an interview with Top Pixar, Dame Meg Taylor, Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, also said the Pacific community is gearing up for the Games. I just think that they're passionate about what they do. They'll go in and do their best and we've just got to get behind them and support them. But I also know that um, in Fiji, they're doing the same. Uh, people are getting ready for the games. There's a lot of excitement in the Pacific actually, talking, uh, people talk about the games. So um, I probably won't be here, but I'll be watching on the television in, in uh, Fiji or wherever I am in the Pacific. And I wish uh, all the athletes from Papua New Guinea all the very best, but I think the most wonderful part of it all is the friendships that you make. However, with the current weather, the public's concerns are continuing to grow. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. And True Guy Sports continues after the break. Stay tuned. True Guy Sports. Good to have you back with Trukai Sports. PNG IFL Chairman Sandis Saka has confirmed and acknowledged the resignation of Brad Tassel in his role as the Chief Executive Officer of PNG IFL and the SP PNG Hunters. Saka says after further deliberation with the Rugby League Board, Shane Morris will lead the interim management team until a candidate has been appointed to take over the role as CEO. The PNG RFL board has assured stability and the commitment of all, all its stakeholders, including the support of the national government. We advise our uh, uh, people of Papua New Guinea that, and our rugby league family throughout the country that the PNG RFL board has uh, accepted the resignation, officially accepted the resignation of Mr. Brett Tassel as the CEO of the PNG RFL. Received uh, the resignation from Jason Tassel. Uh, Brad's brother. Uh, he obviously he was upset and distraught by uh, his brother's resignation. Over to NRL. The five Gold Coast Titans players facing drug charges could be back on the field as soon as this weekend as the club seeks legal advice for their immediate playing futures. And over at Canterbury, Des Hasler has become the first coach to breach the NRL's new etiquette about criticising referees. Bulldogs coach Des Hasler has adopted a novel nickname for the NRL referees after receiving a breach notice under the league's strict new guidelines, which forbid coaches and captains from talking about the whistle blowers in post-match press conferences. When it, um, it comes to understanding the policy, um, about he's whose name you cannot mention, so let's call him Voldemort. Bit of a Harry Potter reference there. Australian all-rounder Glenn Maxwell has made no attempt to hide his wish for a test recall following on from his strong World Cup form. The Aussies take on Scotland in Hobart on Sunday, their last pool match before the knockout stages. And Sri Lanka's Kumar Sangakkara has become the first man in the history of the game to hit four consecutive ODI centuries, smashing 124 against the Scots. 
Ange Postacoglu has named three uncapped players for the Socceroos' upcoming friendlies with Germany and Macedonia. The fixtures will be the side's first since January's Asian Cup triumph. Australian basketball legend Andrew Gase has called for the NBL to be shut down and started again from scratch. It comes after the Townsville Crocs became the second team in just a week to be placed in voluntary administration. In better news for Australian basketball, 18-year-old Victorian Ben Simmons has been named US High School's Basketball Player of the Year. And that wraps up our sports segment tonight. The weather details when we come back. Stay with us. Kai Sport. True Kai Sports. Quick look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in southern region. Port Moresby to look forward to cloudy weather with squally showers and more rain. In Momase, showers plus rain expected in Bunnymore and Lay City. In the New Guinea Islands, a few showers for Lorengau and Kimbe. And lastly, in the Highlands region, all centres to look forward to rain periods. Now, before we go, quickly recapping our top stories again tonight. Polier queries the government spending on infrastructure developments. Also, investigations underway in Bougainville involving the smuggling of large sums of money. And hundreds packed the St. Charles Luanga Catholic Church to farewell late MP Daniel Mona. And that's how we end the news, sports and weather this Wednesday, the 11th of March, 2015. From the entire news team, I'm Tokana Hasavi. Thanks, Eve, for your company. You take care and stay safe. Good night. <laughs>